Most of us simply can't imagine life without a smartphone, so why are some in Silicon Valley disconnecting themselves from their devices? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Now, those people I've just mentioned are the very ones who helped create the technology we use the most on our phone, social media. Developers who believe it's hijacking our minds, changing the way our brains work and even affecting democracy. Our smartphones are there with us wherever we go and we're constantly switched on. But are our phones switching us off from the real world? Developers responsible for some of the most addictive features within social media are concerned about the effects it can have on the brain. Are smartphones hijacking our minds and our lives? Smartphones have democratised access to information for millions of people. 7% of Americans rely solely on their smartphones for access to the internet. They help us navigate our way around cities and have created jobs for thousands of people. They keep us connected to our friends and family. I post about my daughter, um, get in touch with my family who lives abroad. They even help couples fall in love. But have we become so addicted to likes and comments that our online relationships are replacing human interaction? They start to miss or avoid doing the necessary things in life, even at a fundamental level of self-care where they delay eating or avoid eating and drinking. The average person checks their phone 85 times a day and people spend an average of 3.9 years of their lives staring at their phones. Some people are complaining that we spend a lot of our time presenting ourselves to others through Facebook rather than actually just being. Some developers in Silicon Valley are now either switching off or limiting the time they and their children spend on their devices. A recent study found the mere presence of one's own smartphone reduces cognitive capacity, affecting people's ability to focus and perhaps even reducing IQ. Some say that the rise of social media and what's known as the attention economy are the reasons for political earthquakes such as Brexit and the rise of Donald Trump. Does that mean democracy is also at stake? If developers who helped create the technology are removing it from their lives, should we do it too? For all their uses, are smartphones and social media actually making things worse? Are we becoming trapped in a dystopia, increasingly living our lives online instead of in the real world? And with us at the round table, not uh, physically, but uh, via Skype from New York, we're joined by Dr. Nicholas Carderas, a psychotherapist and author of Glow Kids, How Screen Addictions Hijacking Our Kids and How to Break the Trance. With me in the studio, Dr. Daria Kuss who's a psychologist and senior lecturer in psychology from Nottingham Trent University, actually a chartered psychologist uh, I was put right a little while ago. Also with a social media psychologist, Amy Auburn and Jordan Marshall, an employment expert from Ipsy, an independent body representing self-employed people in the UK. And we'll talk about how these things can help you with work. But I must start by saying normally we tell people not to bring their phones into the studio, to turn them off, put them on silent, leave them outside. But just for the purposes of a little social experiment today, we are going to have them with us here. And I'm going to invite all four of my guests to try to avoid looking at them during the course of the programme. And we will see whether that is possible. Nicholas, first of all, in, in New York, you admitted before the programme that could be quite a difficult test for you, but I, I'm just wondering, when you've come up with a title such as Digital Heroin, how much you think it's affecting not just the lives of those who you treat, but also your own life? Well, I, I think that the research is fairly clear that digital devices have an addictive effect. Um, I'm an addiction psychologist and I specialise in the physiology and treatment of addiction. And the brain imaging research over the last four to five years clearly show the parallels on the frontal lobes, on myelination of the brain, uh, the parallels with, and the clinical symptoms of substance addiction and digital addiction are exactly the same. 
When they talk about Facebook depression, what, what do mm -hmm. they mean? Well, there's been several studies that have shown that the depression effect of people who are on social media and the primary reason that people have attributed that has been a, something called the social comparison effect. So in other words, if uh, I'm having sort of a blue day and I'm scrolling through my Facebook news feed and I start seeing the externalized wonderful lives of my Facebook friends, it amplifies my own um, blueness. So gee, my life sucks compared to the wonderful external lives presented by everybody else on Facebook. So it's an amplifier. We know that the digital landscape amplifies things. It amplifies mood disorders. It amplifies potentially hyperactivity. It amplifies depression. Uh, and it amplifies the potential for addiction. And, and let me bring that to, to Daria here in the studio. I mean, you've done some research. And I believe you, you estimate that a third of all notifications make us feel worse. Yes, this is research that we've done together with computer science at Nottingham Trent University, where we were able to um, have a group of participants where we were measuring the kinds of notifications they receive on their smartphones, and at the same time we we're measuring how they're feeling about themselves and uh, in their present state. And we found that about a third of those notifications actually lead to feeling negative, negative emotions, particularly associated with work-related emails, systems notifications, etc. But I also need to state that actually two-thirds of those notifications were experienced as very pleasant, very pleasurable and those were primarily related to social contact so try your your friends and family trying to get in contact with you and chatting with you. See, you. I'm, I'm wondering and uh, Nicholas was talking about addiction here if a third of it if, if a third of what I do during the day makes me feel bad I'm probably going to stop doing it so why don't people stop? Well I think the the first thing that I need to flag is that i I kind of disagree that we have you know that we can label something as digital heroin um, and the whole process of doing so so we when a new media comes up we always have people reacting to it and currently we have huge changes going on in our social lives you know we have the smartphones coming in and yes they you know they really shape our day with notifications that are either positive or negative but what we this has happened through the ages that new technology has come in and people have started questioning what exactly is happening and you know it, do you not believe it's happening or you just not um, had the case proven to you yet? Well, I think that evidence is missing, but also I think we need to be very wary with pathologizing something that is common behavior now. You know, I've I talked to a lot of students, you know, I, I've been, I was recently a student myself and social media and smartphones have become such a key part of our social lives that, you, you know, it's it very hard. Do you find it hard to stop using it? Sorry? Do you find it hard to stop using it? Well, they are, they are part of that social life, but we can't call it an addiction because... Well, put, put that to Nicholas, and then we'll come <laughs> back to you in a minute, Jordan. But Nicholas, um, yeah, the, the point Amy makes is, is that you, it's not an addiction. It's just something we, we happen to do a lot of. Well, I, I can't disagree more strongly. It's clearly an addiction. It meets all diagnostic clinical criteria for an addiction. Uh, an Indiana University School of Medicine study from 2011, it showed that excessive screen usage compromises the dense gray matter of the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex is our executive functioning. It manages and moderates our impulse control and is most correlated with um, addictive disorders. It raises dopamine levels in the same way that substance addiction does. You have addictive devices that are addictive by design. Uh, Tristan Harris of Google speaks very clearly about hiring the top behavioral psychologist to effectively make these devices as dopaminergic and as compulsive and habit forming as possible, you have young people in particular who are more vulnerable to these addictive effects because they don't have the brain development of adults who are much more compromised by these uh, impacts. So I get when people say that, you know, we're overreacting to just the latest generation of technology, but interactive and immersive screens are significantly and qualitatively different than passive stimulation of okay. television. Nic Nicholas, we will come um, back I, to you, and, I, and I, I will give you the right of reply, but I must bring Jordan in at this point, because you talk about the benefits of it all. Yeah, well, the benefits are fairly obvious. I mean, smartphones have opened up huge opportunities for work, for example, through apps or online platforms. And this is particularly helpful for people who have been underrepresented in the labour market. So women, disabled people, young people, um, and the big benefit is flexibility. Say if you have caring responsibilities or you need to take your kids to school, being able to work when you want is hugely beneficial. Let's move this on a stage rather than 
trying to argue whether or not mm. it does exist, the, this addiction. But let's talk about why somebody wants us to use this all the time. It's called the attention economy, I believe, because once Facebook or Google or whoever it happens to be has got you on there, they can direct you towards the people who are paying their wages and otherwise the, the, the advertisers. They've got you hooked, haven't they? So it's, it's, it's in their interest to do this. I, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are downsides, obviously. And as a, as a smartphone user, you need to be careful about knowing when to switch off. But it's also great for consumers. Um, say, if you, if, you, if you want food delivered to your house, you can get that done very quickly. Um, if you want a website developed, it's far easier to, to find a, a good developer. So there are, there are benefits. But there are downsides that we have to manage. What about the attention I, economy? Sorry, yeah, please. No, I think I agree with that we have both positive and negative effects. And I think this is what's been shown really, really broadly is that, you know, we have social media can increase your feelings of being feeling socially connected. It can make you um, give you social support. And naturally, it also has negative sides. But I think the debate needs to move away from pathologizing it to actually seeing it as a balanced view. Yes, naturally, companies are trying to hook users. But actually, we also get a lot of benefits from it. So I think that the debate is sometimes leaning in the wrong direction here. And once they've got your attention, the attention economy, they, they can channel your interests to their own ends. And they can make you want to see particular things that they want you to see. And thereby, the dem democratic process in which we have free will is, is subverted. What do you think? Well, I would agree, yes, potentially interest can be channeled in a particular way. However, we as uh, adult users of technology, smartphone technology, we need to be aware of the potential pitfalls of technology. And we need to be um, aware that there can be potential problems that can result out of excessive use, for example. But this will only ever be the case for a small minority of users who can't uh, control their kinds of behaviours. And for the large majority, probably including most of us, this doesn't necessarily constitute a real problem. I suppose what I'm trying to suggest is it's not just changing the way that we, we interact, it's changing the very nature of the world. Well, I think you're, you're highlighting this notion that algorithms are going to feed us information and change our opinions in the way that the companies want them to. But we need to think back, you know, I, I I'm a Guardian reader, so I choose to read the, that sort of information. And I, that naturally biases the information I get. And the same thing is happening online. And studies have shown that it's not, you know, naturally now that algorithms are involved, people might be scared that those are having a differential effect. But actually, we have always been choosing what sort of information we get by where we live, by what we read, by what radio we listen to. So I think, you know, we can't just say that this is come up with social media. Um, this, this problem has existed, but this is kind of how, how people work. We want to support our own opinion. Nick, Nicholas, do jump in here, because mm. we're, I'm very aware that you're a long way away and you, you, you can't see our faces. But do, <laughs> do you want to refer to anything that's been said or tell me a little bit about what you call adolescent malaise? Yeah, and, and with all due respect to what the panel has said, we're talking about, we're viewing the problem through the lens of our own adult experience uh, my book, Glow Kids, was written about the developmental impacts on children. Um, children don't have the impulse control, the fully developed brain functioning that you or I do. So they're much more vulnerable to developmental disorders, clinical disorders. And so a child that's been raised on a tablet from the time that they were two or three years old, by the time they reach adolescence, from my thousand teenagers that I've worked with, they're much more compromised attentionally, cognitively, and there's an adolescent malaise. They're not as creative. Uh, it's my wife, who's a teacher, calls it um, calls it development interrupted. These children are not developing with a full, rich brain development that they would if they were experiencing the world in real time. Okay, let, let, let me impacts are real. Let me ask the, the the three of you in the studio. Do you think? Because this is one of the things that Nicholas and other people uh, talks about that your ability to focus. Um, your attention span has been changed since you started using a lot of... You're, you're not... Yeah, I, think, I think that's definitely true. For example, if I try and sit down and read a book and my phone's nearby, I'll end up, you know, stopping and, and checking my phone every, every, every few minutes. And I think that, that does affect our ability to, to concentrate on, on particular tasks. And I can imagine that's particularly bad for children who are obviously still developing. But, it, but, it, but does it turn us into fruit flies in as much as we can't settle on any one thing for, 
for a very long Absolutely period of time. Absolutely not. I don't think we need to, you know, view technology as something that is going to destroy our lives mm -hmm. or destroy our children's lives because I think, you know, the kinds of benefits that we see through technology use are significantly greater than the potential pitfalls. And I can, I can see that. We can see that with the, with the labour market. We can see it in media mental health as well related uh, aspects. Uh, media technology can be used in very many very beneficial ways and I think these beneficial ways do but outweigh... Her heroin is a wonderful painkiller <laughs> if you happen to be injured but it's also um, a terrible drug if you become addicted to it. Exactly, well, I, exactly. I, I disagree that there's kind of there's not a lot of evidence out there and actually we can pick out certain evidence um, on small sample sizes that have shown kind of changes in, in the brain. But actually, as Daria said, I really wholeheartedly agree that we can't label a whole action which people use in many different ways as good or bad. And Anne Greenfield is the Children's Commissioner here in the UK, and she says that, you know, it's become such a normal life that we need to see how we use it, not blocking children and cutting them down. And an eminent professor here in London has always said that we need to think about more than just the social media use. We need to see what the children are doing on it, how they're interacting, how they're connecting with people. And actually, it's, it's a lot more complicated than saying, you know, yeah. social media is heroin. I think that is just wrong. Uh, Nicholas, I'll come back to you in, in just a moment, but I want to talk, um, pick up on a point that we've, we've just gone through here, that um, some of it is positive, some of it is, is negative. But um, when in South Korea they looked at how this they could change mm. people's uses they, they decided that it was impossible to put the genie back in the bottle so we have to live with it don't we I think yes we will need to live with technology one way or another but what we can do and what I think we should do is to ensure that we educate people we educate children we educate teachers and parents in terms of how to encourage positive use, beneficial use, use that is going to help people and also make individuals aware of the potential pitfalls which may in some extreme cases include addiction. Okay, so, so when the people who've been at the, the sharp end of preparing Facebook and Google etc etc decide that they don't want their children to go to schools where this kind of technology is used, what, what does that tell you? Jordan, first of all. I think, as has been said, obviously there are benefits but there are downsides that need to be managed. And I think for self-employed people who are much more insecure in their work just by nature of being self-employed. But I'm asking for a personal opinion, yeah. not, not a professional <laughs> opinion. If the man who invented cheese stopped eating cheese because he said it was bad for him and his family, what, would you th what, what do you think about the fact that they, they're not touching it anymore? Both yeah. of you, both of you, yeah. No, I, think, I, I think, think, yeah, I, th I think it's such a new technology and it's become such a huge part of our life that we haven't really stopped and thought about the effects of it. So I, I think we do, we do need to consider how much smartphone use is, is, is beneficial. I think it's an individual decision, you know, and I, I actually went to a lot of schools, so I didn't have technology for quite a we, which long are, time. Which are the type of schools that a lot of these Silicon yeah. Valley people are now sending their children to. And, you know, they, I, I they like it very much, you know, we, yeah. we cooked and we danced our names, but I think the... the I think that's hard to generalize from that action. You know, we're, we're talking about big things like policy change. You know, we're, we're currently really debating this in the public, you know, what, are so, what is social media doing? And for these big actions, you know, wanting to clamp down or, or wanting to regulate technology use, you need a large amount of evidence, and that evidence doesn't exist. OK, and I'm now going to that's go back to Nicholas so on that very that's basis. We can see your lips moving, but I want to put it to you that one of the criticisms of your work is that it's never been peer-reviewed, which is a point that Amy just brings up here. So address that and then also tell me how you treat these kids that are on what you call digital heroin. Right, so I'm a clinician and a university professor, and in my book I've compiled over 200 peer-reviewed studies. So this notion that there's, the evidence isn't there, um, with all due respect, is totally false. There's over 200 research studies that correlate screen time with mood disorders, addictive disorders, attentional deficits. Dr. Dimitri Christakis at the University of Washington has done research that has showed that screen time at certain developmental ages of children's development significantly increases the ADHD effect. That research is clear. We've been asleep at the switch. Uh, we've allowed these devices into our homes and into our classrooms without thoughtful use, without vetting. Nicholas, how, how do you treat? How do you treat? 
Well, I just want to be clear that I'm not against technology. My narrative is age and appropriate technology. Uh, my automobile is a wonderful bit of technology. I just don't give it to my seven-year-olds to drive. Um, so it, having said that, the key here is delaying the onset of when young children are exposed to screen time because they can't manage or moderate their usage of screen time. So treating it is much harder than preventing it. So I've treated screen addiction, and it's really a really difficult addiction to treat. Um, we talk about doing a digital fast for several weeks, so a child can re-regulate uh, their adrenal systems and calm their system down because children are mood dysregulated who have developed a screen addiction. And then we have to go through certain pretty significant addiction protocols that we wouldn't with any other kind of addiction. But it's very difficult to be screen abstinent in the 21st century. So once you develop a screen addiction, it's very difficult to treat. Um, can I just add yeah, something Yeah, please, please do, and then we want to talk um, about sort of how it's changed the world. <laughs> yeah, I know that I keep on banging on about evidence, but I think this is really key, is that evidence comes in different shapes and sizes. You know, we naturally in the media, we often say, OK, a scientific study showed that, but they're actually of, of different qualities. And a colleague of mine, so I'm at the University of Oxford, and he's done a very large scale study over time. Well, has done studies over time, but he's done a study on every fifth um, 15 year old in the UK and actually found that moderate amount of screen time use it actually has beneficial effects so it's kind of it's a shape like this so if you use social media very little they actually have lower well-being and okay, in the okay, middle it's okay, the highest. Okay. That, that, that's clinical <laughs> on both sides what about so, sociologically um, it has changed our lives hasn't it I mean would we have had Brexit would we have had Trump if it weren't for what you find in, in these little things? What's it has, it has absolutely changed the way that we lead our lives. It has certainly changed the way that I live my life. Um, I can't think of how would I be able to do research without my technology. How, how am I going to be able to communicate with any of you whilst I'm on my way coming to London, for example, to tell you I'm five minutes late or let's meet uh, for coffee at, at Costa just around the corner, for example. This has significantly contributed to how convenient our lives have become. It has significantly contributed to the ways in which we can communicate with one another. I've got my family living in different countries in Europe and I can communicate with them anytime, anywhere. I don't really have to bother about, you know, trying to think about my telephone contract because I'm going to pay over the odds just in order to get in contact. But, but is it replacing real life? You I could do all your research the 50 years ago differently, <laughs> but it's... Not I real don't, life, personally, I don't think technology is replacing our real lives. I think technology is adding to our real lives. It's uh, adding a different dimension that we can use in order to complement our lives, make our lives more convenient, more accessible, probably more enjoyable. Particularly when you think about the possibilities that we've got in terms of gaming, for example. You know, these kinds of immersive games that add so much uh, pleasant, so many pleasant experiences to our lives. There are so many potentialities that we have got mm. through technology, and I think we really. So not need a to be dystopia. Um, did it change the way that you thought about the controversial leaving the European Union referendum, which we now refer to as, as Brexit, just over a year and a bit ago? Did it change? Did social media change that? Um, I don't think it changed my kind of my, my impression of it, but the way political campaigning has changed has um, has been huge as a result of being able to target individuals <coughs> through social media. That's true, um, but in terms of the bigger picture, I think, as you say, the benefits definitely outweigh the costs. For example, a former colleague of mine um, left for full-time employment and he's been travelling through Thailand while freelancing mm. through, through an online platform. So the, these types of flexible opportunities are because of the new technology. We'll give Amy the last word in, in just a moment, but Nicholas, uh, to you. Um, you use it yourself quite a lot. What, what sort of certain things do you avoid? I know you're not an adolescent anymore, but what certain things do you, do you try to prevent yourself from doing? Well, my wife would probably tell you that I like my device probably more than it's healthy. So we talk about once a week doing a digital fast. I try to have one day a week where I don't get on my devices because I do know that they can be very um, habit forming. I will say that in the political conversation that you're having, I think it's a, if I can go back to that for a moment, I think it's a much more fundamental problem than just fake news and what news we're reading. I think it's the digital opiate of the masses. I think there's a malaise that's happened. I've worked with young people that are so disconnected from the geo-sociopolitical process because they're being hypnotized by their devices. I think it's a brave new world and this is our SOMA. And have that's you managed I, to stay so off looking at your device 
in front of you during the course of this discussion. Yes or no? Well, uh, yes, I've, I've obviously avoided well done. it, and <laughs> it hasn't been easy. Nicholas, thank you very much indeed. How hard has it been for the three of you uh, not to look? Do you, are you desperate now to look? It's it, no. like the person who wants to smoke but can't smoke <laughs> on a plane and has a cigarette eight hours later the moment they land. I think short periods of time are not necessarily a problem. Do you want to check it now? I can, I can see what's happening, so I've received some emails, I've received some messages, probably from friends asking me how, how am I doing today, but um, <laughs> we, are, we are all, uh, I think we are all quite keen to, to know what's going on in our social circles. If I may say so, Amy, I think you've got an old one there. Yes. And what do you think? What do you think? It's been tough? Well, I think, you know, I've had a very engaging discussion, so I didn't That's need great. to look at it. That's but... great. And I didn't even see, Jordan, your eyes stray once. I've managed to resist. I'm just going to have a quick look here. I have... Uh, Apparently no friends, nobody's <laughs> trying to get in touch with me. From all of us here on Roundtable, thank you for watching. I hope you found the, the conversation stimulating. I certainly have. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye for now.